everybody that's tuned in today. <clears throat> it's just about time for the start service. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed the music. Uh, I prayed Brother Jackie Benton. A lot of people that used to be in what we call a message knows Brother Jackie. been around for many, many years. And I do believe he was anointed to sing. Everybody that has the Holy Ghost is anointed for something. And even if you don't have the Holy Ghost, there's many singers that are anointed to sing. Sometimes I use that gift to go to the country or please the world, but make money. But uh, <clears throat> I appreciate that. And I appreciate Brother Larry, our song leader for many years there at Cape Girada. Uh, he was the one you hear singing there after Brother Jackie, and uh, we really appreciate him. I think he's anointed to sing as well as being a Christian. Appreciate him and his wife listening today. I assume they are. He doesn't usually call but or let me know, but he said that they will uh, always listen yearly. And we're glad we got Brother Lloyd and Sister Ann on, uh, Sister Dorothy French, Brother Taylor down in Texas, Brother Ed and Sister Teresa in Kingsport, Tennessee, Brother Tom and Sidney in uh, Scott City, Brother Don Owensboro, Kentucky, or close to it, Sister Mary Ann Springfield, Brother Roy Payne, Kingsport, Brother Mike Melinda, Cape Girada, Brother Michael Riley's listening, he said tonight, that's in uh, uh, Jeffersonville, Brother Larry and Sister Kay, close to Brownsville, Brother Kurt and Sister Marva, Owensboro, John McKinnon, I'm not sure, Brother John, where, where you live, I get confused about it, Brother John Donahue and family up in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, Mike and Sarah Stratton said they would be listening, and uh, Later, they're working, I guess, now, having to take part-time job because of some things that's happening. I think I mentioned Brother Lloyd and Sister Ann, uh, Diamond, Missouri. Sister Dorothy, of course, is in Chicago, and we need to pray for her and her husband, Brother Jimmy Franks, their, ch their daughters, Carol and Rebecca, and their son, Jimmy Franks Jr., that's there, I suppose, all in Chicago, as far as I know, and Terrible place to be in a big city right now because we don't know what's going to happen. But anyway, we're thankful for all of you that joined in. Uh, I've sent you another text or email, if you got it, with some scriptures. And if I have time at the end of this service, I'm going to play a video. And it'll be self-explanatory mostly, but I will uh, briefly talk about it. If I have time at the end of the service, one thing. And uh, second thing, if I can make it work. Someone, I heard someone say, uh, I guess they quoting from a movie, uh, I don't know the name of it, it might have been a Star Trek or one of them movies like that, that they said they go where no man's ever gone before, and that's what I'm doing on some of this video and uh, things, I'm doing things I've never done before, but I, I hope they'll work. But I'd like to play the video, well, I have a reason, it's, it's a spiritual reason. So Lord bless you, let's read First John 3. This is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He giveth commandment. And he that <coughs> keepeth His commandment dwelleth in Him, and He in Him. And hereby we know that He abideth in us by the Spirit which He has given us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this day, and we're thankful for the People that's let us know they've checked in today, Lord. We're thankful for everyone, faithful people that's been with us many, many years. We're thankful for every one of them. I pray your blessings. May they find what they need from you, Lord. And may you reveal your spiritual word to them. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name and for his glory. Amen and amen. God bless you. And again, thank you for just listening. Uh, we trust that everything's working all right. As far as I can see, it is. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm going to try to get the recording, <coughs> excuse me, if I can, working for the movie where the people on the uh, telephone can hear it. I'm not sure I can do that, but we're going to try anyway when we do that. But let's, let's go. I call this Keeping His Commandments. And I've been through a few trials and errors through churches in my life. Most of you heard me say it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I started out with the Lord in the Baptist church. I, I, I never remember a sermon on the Trinity or God called a triune God. Now, they may have, but I sure don't remember it. And I was attended two or three Baptist churches for a few years there until I went to Pentecost. And, uh, and Pentecost has a lot of commandments. 
And I always wondered back then, Pentecost, I, it was strange. They talk about, you know, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're ready to go to meet the Lord. You're a Christian. But then every time uh, the preacher would preach, or we'd have what they call a revival. And they give what they call an altar call. But nearly the whole church would be down there crying, ask God's forgiveness, mercy, and feel like they've done something wrong. Well, commandments of man that churches put on, you can do one or two things or both things. One, they can keep you condemned, where you're just under the pressure, or under the fist, sometimes of the pastor. It always feels like you're lacking, you're not quite there, you've got to quit struggling to get there. Uh, <clears throat> that's one thing. Or the other is the commandments they give you, and you're doing them, might make you feel self-righteous. And... Uh, the church I was in, I can't speak for everybody, made me feel a little, a little bit of both, you know. I, I felt condemned because I, I wasn't lining up to what they said I should. and I felt a little bit self-righteous because I thought I was in a church that was right and the others were all wrong. So it goes both sides. That's kind of bad. But let's talk about the commandments of Jesus partially. I'll probably get into a little other things. And I'll try to not keep this over one hour with the video, or maybe not that long. Depends how long I go through this. But we do have to keep the commandments. Jesus told us that. It's, it's about love. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. Forgive me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. All right. If you love the Lord, and keep his commandments, the Lord will manifest himself to you. And his Father will love you, it says there. And also, he tells us this, that his apostles, John 17, would also tell us his word. And he prays for them in John 17. I don't pray for these alone, but for them which also shall believe on me through their word. So he knew that the apostles would carry on his word. See, <clears throat> and our faith must be based. If you look Acts 1, verse 2, talks about Jesus and the day he was taken up. That means he was no longer speaking on earth with a, a, a fleshly voice, his fleshly body. He'd been changed. He was caught up to heaven. And he wasn't speaking <clears throat> through that anymore, but it says here in Acts 1, after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles who he had chosen. And Paul mostly was the apostle to the Gentiles that brought the things that the Lord wanted. And we'll, we'll read about them in a moment. But let me, let me say this, see. The word that Jesus himself spoke, and we got most of that recorded in what we call the four Gospels, but also what the apostles preached, we believe to be the word of the Lord. Uh, we can talk about the scriptures being lost and the Bible not being in English certain years and all this, but I believe that the God that could speak and create heaven and earth could keep his word intact, that people can read it, believe it, and be saved by it. And I believe he has done that through the years. And I know people try to change some things, and I know there's some things in the King James Version that... Uh, a little hard to understand in this time we live in, but uh, God's give us a way to understand it and understand some words might mean things different when we read them. Uh, God will work, but who will let? I use that a lot of times, you know, because I've heard Pentecost preachers preaching God's wanting to work here, but we won't let him. But that word let means who can stop. It doesn't mean uh, we're constraining God because you can't constrain God, that's for sure. But let's talk about some of the commandments. Jesus talked about a commandment, and it's actually found in law. It's not found uh, in the New Testament to the New Testament church. And don't, don't look at me and think, well, you mean we're not supposed to do this? Of course we are. Let me get to that in just a minute. But they asked him, Jesus asked, what's written in the law? And he told him what was in the law, You'll love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, That is answered right. This do, thou shalt live. But now in the New Testament, yes, I believe we must love the Lord our God with all our heart. No true Christian 
fails to do that. And our conversion, when we're converted, that, that proves and He loved us and it makes us love Him. If you're converted, born again, a child of God, then I believe you love God with all your heart. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love Him because He first, first loved us and showed His love by dying for us, by calling for us, by providing everything we need at Calvary. And it's just our faith, and He even gives us faith. And as Christians, we all have a measure of faith. That's exactly right. But as far as ability now, you can tell people you got to love the Lord with all your heart, love your neighbors yourself. That was a law. But I don't believe the Bible says in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, it's not in man to direct his own steps. And I believe that with all my heart. I, 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 I do not believe that any man can direct his steps. I don't do, do not believe uh, we can choose to love the Lord on our own. But it takes a supernatural something within us to make us love the Lord and even to cause us to love our neighbor as herself. Man's nature is greedy, selfish, self-centered. There's so many things I can say about it. We're told to forgive as we are forgiven. And I pray every day, every day I believe. I, don't, I might miss a day, but I don't believe it. If God, give me grace to forgive people just like I'm forgiven that trespass against me and that have trespass against me. I've prayed and things have come up for me years that I didn't even know was my heart that I was holding against somebody they'd done something to me and I'd have to get down on my knees and God take it out of me. Because it's not something we can do on our own. Every spiritual commandment that I'm going to talk about here is not something you can do Churches preach it like you got to do it. No, no. You do it by love or you don't do it. And you don't do it by your own ability. God Himself gives you the ability to do this through grace. And I'll talk more about that maybe. But Paul talks about it. Romans 13, Oh, no man anything. You read the rest of the chapter. I believe he's talking about uh, governments and uh, magistrates and so on. But... He says, love one another, and then he gives us a few things not to do. Don't commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, don't bear false witness, in other words, don't lie about somebody. Uh, not covet, in other words, don't desire something uh, that you shouldn't have. Don't desire something somebody else has got that you don't have. And if there be any other commandment, any other commandment, it's, it's briefly, he says, Briefly means quickly. Just It's over with. This is it. Comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. Work, love works no ill to his neighbor. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to go down to my neighbor and write him a check for my bank account. That's not what that means. It means that if I have a need that I can't supply myself, if I was hungry and didn't have a way to get food, I'd want my neighbor to help me out. I wouldn't ask him probably. And I'm the same way. If I know anyone, Christian or whoever they are, that is hungry uh, or needs something within reason that's willing to work and for some reason beyond their capabilities uh, are, are caught in a bad situation, I will help them. And I believe every Christian will do the same thing. And, but again, that's something supernatural. Because most people look at somebody and say, well, they deserve what they got. I don't know that. I don't know why people are homeless. Uh, I see them sometimes, but I pray about it. I see these people stand on the corner. Uh, I'm hungry. Feed me. I passed someone the other day. I thought, well, do I need to? I wouldn't give him money, but I would buy him something to eat. But then, you know, just a little bit, you see, help needed. And they're not interested in working as long as they get a handout. Now, I, I don't say you to help those kind of people. But let's go on to something else right now. Right and commandments. See, the whole Word of God really is a commandment to us. And our lives fulfill those commandments supernaturally. We don't plan on doing it. We don't do it because we say, well, we've got to do this or we can't do this. It's just something in us teaches us what's right and what's wrong. 
Now, Paul wrote this uh, in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, 1 Corinthians had said many things to the church. Uh, it's, it's from the Lord's Supper. He talks about that. He talks about the divisions in the church, uh, the confusion in the church. 1 Corinthians, I'm talking about it. He talks about women's hair, men's hair. He talks about many things, but down in uh, about chapter 12, 13 in Psalm, he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And we know today there's many churches that absolutely just don't believe the gifts of the Spirit. They just vehemently stand against them. But that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, most preachers think they're spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. See, so all those things that Paul wrote, and they wasn't talking about just one chapter there, the Original writings weren't even broken down chapters and verses. Paul was said the things I write to you. When he wrote chapter 1, he was writing the commandments of the Lord. When he wrote chapter 14, he was still writing the commandments of the Lord. When he talked about the gifts of the Spirit, he was still writing the commandments of the Lord. So these are the commandments that we're to obey and believe that are in the Scripture and that are there for us. There's no question about that. See, <clears throat> And I believe that, verse 38, I believe I, I can identify with and say a person don't believe gifts this day and time. They're just ignorant. That's what Paul's saying. Just let them be ignorant. He even tells us to covet. You know, we're not supposed to covet the worldly things, but we are to covet the gift of prophecy, to be able to foretell, to see things. And don't forbid, you know, like all that tongues, you got to no, don't forbid to talk tongues. Don't do it. They're right there in our languages, we would say. I believe many just regard those. Peter, Second Peter 3. You may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostle Lord Jesus Christ. So again, he's telling his commandments of Jesus Christ are found in the words of the apostles. We have the scriptures. We read them, we believe them, see. Let's look at 1 John 4. And this is the first scripture I said that got my attention thinking about this. First John 4 is a commandment, just like love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. But very few people will do it, and people that won't do it most likely are deceived, will be deceived. If they don't repent, will stay deceived. And that is to try the spirits, whether they are God or not. And, and you should, and I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm sure you can find fault with my life, with me. Uh, I make all kinds of mistakes. Uh, I know uh, last week my notes had September on them. I'm about a month behind, so, but I know it's October. September is just a mistake, but I make other mistakes. Sometimes I do things I feel, I feel convicted that I shouldn't have done it. and I call out to God, forgive me, and give me grace not to let it happen again if it's something. So I'm not pointing to myself, but, but I do believe that we should try spirits. You should try my spirit. I know that we have about, looks like 24, 25 people listen to me tonight, say they're listening. Sometimes people tell me they're going to listen, they don't, uh, for some reason or another. But tonight we probably have 25 people listening, and I know on YouTube there's, there'll be about 50 or 60 people probably listening to this sermon. Uh, <clears throat> so try me. I try my spirit to see if it's of God. Now, the way I sound, I'm not talking about the way you feel. I'm not talking about chills running up and down your back or feeling something like electricity. Uh, people get deceived by that. Uh, that's not what you try the spirit by. There's only way to try the spirit is by the word that I know. See, you don't keep the commands of the Lord by your own ability. You, you can't do it. I know. I've been there, and I'm judging by myself, though. I couldn't. I couldn't. Nothing is ever accomplished except by Christ. I'll give you the scripture after a while for that, too. It must be something supernatural, the ability of Christ within you, doing what He wants you to do, not what you can do. People try to bring the flesh in uh, control, I want to say, in us. Uh, submission and it has to be in submission don't mean it's got to do something right but it's got to be quiet it can't interfere with the spiritual leadership 
if if you need to pray for somebody, you don't need the flesh to say, well, I need to, you know, go hunting or something. Uh, I, I hope I make that clear. I don't mean to be s- silly with things. But Jesus promised it would ask. And that's why I'm trying to point to this, that we in ourselves will never be able to accomplish through our fleshly ability anything for the Lord. I've failed, I know, in my fleshly understanding, my fleshly education, my fleshly knowledge has failed. It has to be something spiritual, see? So that's what I'm talking about. Because what's in us to discern the Spirit, if you're a Christian, now if you're not a Christian, see, before you get tied up in any group or religion or doctrine or start following something, make sure that you've got the teacher in you. That's the Holy Ghost. See, Second Peter 1 says, according to His divine power, not us, He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that's called you to glory and virtue. Now, not our knowledge, it's His knowledge, see? And then it says we're given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you may be partaker of the divine nature. That means to take part of the divine nature. That don't mean you, your flesh will because your flesh is corruptible. It can't even go to heaven until it's changed. You can't even attend from God physically until your flesh is changed and this corruption puts on incorruption. This mortal has to put on immortality. But it's talking about something inside you that is the divine nature that will only go to the Word of God and the will of God. And that has, it's not something your mind can just figure out. You know, not what things know with the spirit of a man except the spirits in him, and so man knows no man knows the things of God except by the Spirit of God that God gives us. He gives us the mind of Christ if we ask for it. And Jesus said, Ask it'll be given, seek you'll find, knock and it'll be open. That cannot fail. That's a promise of God. We've got to believe that, see. First Colossians, uh, God would make known what is the richest of this glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. See? And the 29th verse, I also labor, striving according to His working, which worketh in me mightily. Notice Paul didn't take credit for anything he was doing, but his working was Christ in him, not him. And that's what's got to be in you, see? We fail trying to live a Christian life, but Christ can't fail. He within you is able to keep you, to keep your flesh subdued, and, and you're dead to, to the, what the flesh would take you against the Word of God. We have to live some things in the flesh. We have to eat, we have to sleep, and there's nothing wrong with fish and hunting, and a few pleasures this life. Uh, <clears throat> if we don't overdo it or get addicted to it, but... <clears throat> It's Christ in us that brings out the spiritual that we need to know, see? Now, the only one, the way I know to try spirits is by the Word of God. And I'm going to try that by the Word. You know, people talk about we need a revival. Well, I don't, the word revival is not even in the Bible. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Revive is. You say, well, it's the same thing. Not, not exactly the same thing. Uh, it's used, I don't know, I've got the number of times it's used, I don't know how many. But mostly it means uh, when Israel was in bondage, they meant to be taken back to their land and sown. When people were sick, they got revived. And I understand the meaning of revival. Uh, <clears throat> but we're always told not to sleep as others did. And if we take that commandment and we don't sleep, then we don't really need a revival. See, I was checking with Brother Hall this morning to make sure the phone and the video was working. I heard him talk about, you know, people say, let the power of the Lord come down. They're talking about something they feel. But that's nothing to do with it. The power of God can work in you and you not feel a thing. But you will see the results, see. Too many, much is based upon emotions. And I'll, I'll get to that a little more. Let's read... Uh, before I get to this, I think I've got Matthew 24 there, verse 10. But it's been mentioned, and it is truth, that there's most people out there uh, on YouTube, it's become a very 
great means of communication with all religions. But the majority out there of religions that you'll hear, that I've heard anyway, you, you, you may can find something different, but they're talking about a great revival to come. Uh, people talk about the two witnesses over in Revelations that they're going to raise up and these, they'll talk about the great things that's about to happen. Uh, they'll talk about Israel being restored back and they'll talk about uh, all these different things going to happen. You say, well, Brother Joe, do you believe that? Well, it'd be nice if it happened, but I believe the Scriptures. So what does the Scriptures say about a great revival coming? Uh, I've just got a few things down here. Like I said, I got Matthew, I think, 24.10, I believe. Excuse me for licking my finger there. I believe that's a scripture, 24.10. It says, many, many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Think about enduring. Of course, I've, I've been in a, a severe car wreck Two of them that I'm supposed to have been dead, both of them, but it didn't happen by God's grace. Fell off a ladder and broke my leg. I've been in a lot of pain. And you're not much you can do but endure it. They get you to the hospital or something, they dope you up with morphine or something, kind of ease things. But a Christian endures every day. And the closer it gets to the end time and this evil that surrounds us, the more you have to endure. Uh, people get excited. Uh, you know, I've had people just hear me the first time and I talk about just staying with the Word and they get excited and then they're gone. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, they're like, you know, the seed on shallow ground immediately sprung up with joy but when persecution comes and every Christian will be tried with persecution one way or another, some kind. But enduring... It's what we do every day because Satan is after us and he's trying us. He doesn't relax. He doesn't rest. He's got some demon talking to us all the time, working with us, trying to get to us, depress us, something. But he that endures, endures to the end. So you have to endure. The same, Jesus said, would be saved. Look at uh, Luke 18. They asked the question, would God not avenge his elect that crying to him day and night? Someone said, well, the elect don't cry for vengeance. Well, they do. It says right there. He, they cry unto him dead and night, and you find that over in the fifth seal. But will he avenge him speedily? But look at the question Jesus asked. When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Now, why would Jesus say that? See, because he could look down and know how narrow the end's going to be. And how few people really base their faith on the Scriptures and the Word of God. And I don't mean to say this point to myself at all, but how few preachers will just preach the Word of God and nothing else. I don't know any way to say that anyway. Second Timothy 3, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. See, I, I cannot see that's speaking of a great revival at the end time. A lot of people take Revelation 7, I got it down there, a little of it, and they believe that Israel, 144,000 are going to be saved, and some of them teach that 144,000 are going to evangelize the world, and then that great group that no man can number will be their converts. Well, of course, I don't believe that. Uh, let's read Revelation 7, a couple of scriptures there. I'm not going to take a lot more time, but... John heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Then in 7 verse 9, he noticed a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed white robes and palms in their hands. How big is that great multitude? Well, that's used 17 times in the Scriptures, and no, no time was it used in millions, or even hundreds of thousands, I don't believe. I don't know how many it meant. See, I mean, it said no man can number. That's right, because John wasn't told how many was there. 
And he was seeing a great group, and he knew that he could number them. Now, how, how, well, he knew the number of Israel. He did. But he didn't number them. He heard the number. I believe if John had looked out at that number of Israel and said, that's Israel, he'd said, well, what are they? How many are they? What tribes are they from? But see, God separated Israel for a reason. They were first fruits. That's plain for the scripture. I, I won't go into that. But they were first fruits, see. And God separated them and showed he kept his word. As Paul said, in this time when Israel had crucified their Savior, put him upon the tree, cried out, let him be crucified. You know, they were excited when Jesus was healing the sick and whole cities come out. He healed every one of them. There was times he healed them all, it said. Every one of them got well. Uh, when people requested, I don't find any turned them down. But <clears throat> what was that crowd when they led him to Calvary? No doubt some of those same people were caught up in the enthusiasm, uh, if I'm going to call it that, the excitement of those who crying out, let him be crucified. Because healing... Miracles, signs, they won't hold you. Only the Word of God will hold you. I, I don't know any other way to say that, but that, that is the truth, see? Are you talking about a great multitude, like Mark 14, when Jesus came, there was a great multitude came to get Jesus. That don't mean thousands. It just means a, a lot of people. Uh, Luke 5, when he seen Jesus there on the shore, they got a great multitude of fishes. How many they have? Well, just the nest full. I don't know how many it was, a thousand. And that's what I'm trying to say. A great multitude that no man can number don't mean millions. How many do you think it is, Brother Joe? It don't matter. What does matter if me or you are just one of them? That's all that matters. How many is there doesn't matter. Just so we're part of that group, by God's grace, it's redeemed and clothed in white robes, not our own righteousness. So I hope you understand that, see, what I'm trying to say anyway. Let me go a little further. i got a little more time left here. I've got Matthew 7. I'm, I don't know if I'll read it, but Jesus warned us about false prophets in sheep's clothing. What does that mean? That means anyone like me or any minister claims to be a minister, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher would act in every way like a Christian. They'd be clothed in sheep's clothing. In other words, if you look at the outside, they appear to be a real Christian. But inside, he said, they're raving wolves. What does a wolf do? A wolf will destroy sheep. And a lot of people don't realize the doctor they're feeding on is destroying them. And a lot of people don't realize that nice, kind pastor, priest, whoever he might be, the teaching error might lend you money, might console you, might, you know, give you right directions on some things. But if he's teaching you error, he's a ravening wolf. See? <clears throat> so that's what Jesus said. And then he talks about trees bringing forth fruit. And that's Matthew seven fifteen through 19. If you don't have notes, you can get them. If you go to my website, if you're listening on YouTube, you can download the notes for every sermon. They're on there. This is included. It's there right now. But he talks about every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down, cast the far. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, I could take you to the lives of several biblical people, and you said by their fruits they don't look like they're going to make it, but they, they did. But the fruit's not necessarily just your life, because you can live a good, moral, seemingly spotless life and still be lost. But when it talks about trees bringing forth fruit, now, Jesus represented himself as a vine and us as the branches. But I think we can understand that the only right tree would be Jesus Christ. And we're not a tree if you're a Christian, you're a branch. And there are many trees out there, which is, I call them churches or groups, they're out there producing their own fruit. They're building great buildings. They're taking care of their children. They're, uh, they tell me they're in Jeffersonville without just going and naming names that uh, the one that's over 
the system there it has about five or six parsonages for his family and him and taking care of everybody. Uh, one time, a hundred million dollars in one account, and uh, I'm sure they live uh, very luxuriously, been in all kinds of programs, buying property, and they say they're doing it for the people, but I assure you, all that property, when all said and done, it goes right back into the names of the ones that has control over it. Real churches that's got extra money or anything extra, if they know another little group that needs help, they're going to share that money with them. They're going to spend it all on themselves. So enough of that, huh? Enough. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. And my father is a husbandman. He says a branch, you can start out growing in Christ, not really converted, but if you don't bear his fruit, he'll take them away. If you are there, he'll always be purging you to do more. That don't mean you're lost. He just wants more out of you. See, that's what it says if you read it on that. But he said, without me... And there's the point I've been trying to make. Without me, Christ, you can absolutely do nothing. There's just nothing you can do. You're wasting your time. See, that's why I'm trying to point people. Have an experience with Jesus Christ. I, I worry about some people that listen to me regularly. Uh, I, I, I don't know you. I can't see you. Some I hadn't seen in many years. I'm concerned about your spiritual welfare. I pray for people's family, for them. I don't know how else to say it. I, well, I've got my mind on this. Remember Jimmy Taylor? He's really sick. Last time I talked to him. Most Many of you that's connected here know who I'm talking about, him and Sister Brenda. He goes to Brother Ivy's, a message church over in uh, Gibson, Missouri. Or he did. They closed the church down on account of the virus. But he's really sick, and uh, he's about my age. So pray for him if you feel led. Uh, our, our prayers are useless in Lord, unless the Lord acknowledges them and it has to be his will i realize that see so let's go on every good tree is christ excuse me the only good tree excuse me not every good tree the only good tree is christ and we can only be branches with the life of christ coming out through us producing fruit or we're nothing but a branch that's going to be cast away and burnt someday see and a lot of churches start out with the right motive. I know people talk about the way it used to be, and I do too. The Baptist church that I went to, I'd walk in the door for church, and the whole church would be on their knees crying out to God. You go in that same church today, you won't find it like that. You'll find maybe a place to get coffee and a donut and fellowship a little while before the chief preacher tells you some kind of a story and the next social activity coming up. The Pentecost church I started out in an old store building, I believe, started out right. Absolutely. But it wasn't long before we got thinking, well, we need to get with some other people. So we joined, I believe, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ back then, a group, organized group. I don't know if they still exist, but then he, he got thinking we need to get bigger now. So he went to the United Pentecostal Church, and he did get bigger. One of the biggest churches in a little town of Malden, Missouri. And then he thought he needed to be bigger, so he moved to Dorm, North Carolina. Now he is, I don't know, over 2,000 church and join another organization that's bigger than the first one for some reason or another. Yes, <clears throat> he can do many things. You can use an ability that God give you to build yourself up. But God doesn't use anything to attract his sheep but sheep food. And sheep food is the Word of God. Other programs, other... Uh, great singers and things like that, they attract people. Some people like preachers that can, you know, really get excited. And that's okay. I'm not running that down if people like that. But that has nothing to do with the truth. The truth is what is spoken, and that's what you need to listen to, see. Uh, the seven churches in Asia, the seven churches, not church ages, seven churches, they had problems. And like I said, every group starts out, I believe, trying to do right. They may be an error, some error. And if they belong to a denomination, certainly they're an error. But a lot of groups start out of the church. They start out right, seeking the truth. But no matter how honest you are, the devil, if you've got a group, will try to infil infiltrate you. He'll try to get in there and invade you. He'll try to get in there and influence. You can find it in the church, you see. Ephesus started out right. They lost his first love. 
it got infiltrated. The people got kind of cold. Absolutely. And you're going down to the false prophets and their tariff, I'm saying that right, the dying of spiritual life and Sardis, the self-righteousness of Laodicea, who felt like they needed nothing. And you see the fruit of people. I'm not talking about Christ's fruit, but the fruit of churches that you can't tell them anything. You know, and when they say they have need of nothing, they still got an offering out there. Some words just send them a little money. No matter how big they are or what they got, they usually got something to sell you and a way to give them more money. That's not God's way. <coughs> Paul one time told the church, I, I, I don't need any more. I've got plenty. Don't don't say it anymore. You, you won't see that spirit too many places, I don't believe. But it's still the truth. He told uh, Jezebel, which that's a spirit. I believe it represents a church, thrown in a bed. Uh, those who commit adultery with her, they'd have children. Those children would die. I believe that brings you over to Revelation 17, that that become the great whore. See, once the devil starts infiltrating any group, they can't stay spiritual unless they stay on the Word. And once they get off the Word a little bit, they have no power to resist the devil or the demons that were, come in there with false doctrine. And that's why all the chaos today, that's why all the trouble today because people have failed to hold everything to the Word. Well, I'm getting close to out of time, see. Jude 1 talks about, and all error comes from a leader that people listen to. They, they're they like Israel. Israel got tired of the prophet. He was getting old. His sons wasn't following his footsteps. And I understand that. But God would have a way to take care of people if they trust him. No, they want a king. So God give them a king. You see what he was. Well, God used David as a tap, I know. But when people choose a man to lead them and take a man and let a man con them into believing him for leadership, they've turned down the Holy Ghost. Because God sent not a man to lead you, but the Holy Ghost to lead you. As I, a man, and any other man can only do is point you to the Word. From that place on, it's you and Jesus Christ, no one else. Well, Jude 1 talks about people that speak evil of the things they know not. People call me a heretic because I still believe in one God the way I've taught it. And I also believe in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. I, I'm not a Trinitarian, so they'll say I'm a heretic. They'll speak evil of me. That's fine. Not a problem. But it said they have gone the way of Cain. That's false worship. That's Jude one eleven. They run greedily after the heir of Balaam. That's getting that money coming in, see? And perished in the gainsay of Gory. That Cory, C O R E, Cory. His gainsaying is not accepting spiritual authority. Spiritual authority in that day was Moses. Spiritual authority in this day is the Holy Ghost. Not a man. A man can have spiritual authority, but it's the Word of God. If he don't give you that, then he don't give you anything. See? In conclusions, all the commandments that are given us in the New Testament have to be kept with love. 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. 1 Corinthians 13, Charity, our love, suffers long. In other words, puts up things a long time. Don't lose it. Don't get upset. It's kind. It don't envy other people. Maybe other people, oh, you know, I'd love to be able to sing. I hear Brother Larry sing like on the first, oh, I wish I could sing something like that. Well, I can't, I can't carry a tune. But I'm not envious of him. I'm glad that he and others have the ability to do things I can't do. See? It don't vaunt itself. In other words, you don't say, look, it's me that's doing this. See, you listen to me and I'll do it. And I'll, I, it, it don't do that. Not love don't. It's got you fooled somebody pointing to himself. See, always. See, simplicity of the commandments to the Gentiles is found in Acts 15. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That's starting out. Abstain from meats offered to idols. In other words, if you were going to eat, and this guy says, this was offered to an idol, don't eat it. Not for your sake, but for his sake. So just stay away from it. It's not wrong to eat beef or whatever kind of meat you want to eat. From blood, from things strangled, from fornication, if you keep yourself, you shall do well, fare you well. Of course, the other commandments are in the Word, but it's all real simple. Love the Lord. Love your neighbors yourself. 
Because if you love the neighbors yourself, you're not going to do anything in your life that will hurt other people on purpose. I'm going to stop right now, and I'm going to try to play this video, but let's pray first, all right? Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd bless the people that's here listening, and I, I pray that they could receive something, Lord, from you. I pray that those that are sick, Brother Roy, his knee, I pray that you'd touch him, Lord. I, I know he's older, and I'm older, and I know her body's breaking down, but you can give us strength. And I pray you give him strength. Jimmy Taylor's just my friend, Lord. I know we don't agree on some things, but he's my friend. I pray for him and his wife. I pray for people in need, wherever they are, whoever they are. But most of all, Lord, I pray for people that will believe the gospel, as you said you did. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Now, you're on the phone. I don't know if I can manage to get this over to you or not, but I will try if you'll be patient. But we're just going to start and see what happens. So I pray it'll work, and we'll just have to see. And uh, those scriptures I sent you, you're going to hear a man, if it works, his name is Kent Christmas. Christmas is like the day they call Christmas. Uh, it says you can download this and share it, so that's what I'm doing. I did. And he's preaching at the big rally they had in Washington, I think it was September 20th. Uh, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, was there preaching. Uh, I think uh, Cain or Kain, uh, this uh, Israelite Jewish man that preaches, got a beard, and I was supposed to have some kind of understanding about scriptures to teach people. They all had a big meeting there, and this man was one of the speakers. And uh, you that know singers, uh, Candy Hemphill is his wife. And when they got married, of course, they kind of joked a little bit because her name was Candy Christmas, and they said you should turn around and be, well, you know. But Candy Candy Hintpale, which is Candy Christmas, is his wife, so a lot of you, I know Brother Larry knows who I'm talking about if he's listening. So this is his husband. He has a large church down in Nashville, Tennessee. So Lord bless you, and if it works, it works. If it don't, God bless you. I'll let you know I tried, and we'll close this thing. So let's see. By the authority of the Holy Ghost, we take dominion today over the powers of darkness that have ruled over our nation, and we command them to be broken in the name of Jesus. For this is the hour of the church, says the Lord, and not the hour of man. And by the end of this year, says God, the greatest outpouring that you've ever seen is going to hit the United States of America. Starting January 20. In this year, hallelujah, God is going to begin to declare that there is a release of an unprecedented move of the Holy Ghost like we've never seen in our lifetime. Thus saith God, I'm coming after the strongholds that have ruled over this nation for decades, and I am pulling them down by the power of the Spirit of God. For the violence that you see in the land and the roaring that you hear over our nation is demon spirits that are crying out because the angels of the Lord have come to silence them for this hour. And just as the world has put a mask on the church and just as the world has put a muzzle on the people of God, the spirit of intimidation that has risen against the church, I, the Lord thy God, now I'm going to take that spirit and I'm going to put it on the world and the heavens that have been brass says the Lord I'm breaking by the power of the Holy Ghost for four years saith God from night to for 2021 through 2024 this is the last final harvest saith God that is going to hit this church no demon will be able to stop the glory of the Lord that's coming get ready says the Lord for the holiness of God is coming up in this hour and I, the Lord thy God, will take no back seat to a man. For what I'm getting ready to do, says the Lord, will not be known by personality or name, but it will be known by the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pull down strongholds over this nation. 
Fox Sports will not recover, though they say they will. Theaters are going to remain empty, saith God. And the church is going to begin to fill up. And the glitter of sin that has drawn the sinner to the world is now going to be tarnished. And I'm going to cause the church, saith the Lord, to rise to her feet. There is a roar of the line of Judah, saith God. I'm going to release divine healing upon the nation. I am also coming after a generation of young people that have never been in church, never known God. I'm going to invade the homosexual community and I'm going to set them free by the power of the Holy Ghost. There is anointing, saith the Lord, that I am releasing over this nation just as the laws have come out of this city in the natural, saith God. So now is there a law being released out of heaven that says my church will not be silent for though I am raising up, hallelujah, mighty men for the spirit of Jezebel has ruled over this nation for a century. But I have raised up an Elijah anointing, saith God, that's going to break the spirit of Jezebel and there's going to be peace in the land. There's going to be silence amongst the liberals, saith the Lord, and I'm going to put a war in the mouth of my people, even to the age of young five and six year olds. The glory of God is getting ready to come down upon this nation. Give a shout, saith the Lord, for I have not forgotten thee. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. In 1906, William Seymour said this, there is another revival coming up about a hundred years and it's the bloodline is going to cross the color line. Hear God today. This is not about color. This is not about culture. This is about the church. And God said the church is my body. So today I release healing into you. I release a spirit of boldness upon you. Yet come against the spirit. Rise up, saith God. Whatever you bind, I'll bind. Whatever you loose, I'll loose. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is a liberty, saith the Lord. I am releasing over this land and it is a harvest of souls. Your churches are going to fill up. Your children are going to praise the Lord. Your bodies are going to be healed because I declare it, saith God, and it shall be done, saith God.